Bill introduced him to many of the characters that would populate his future work. It was here that he first encountered Dan Padiandi, the most famous matchmaker of them all. And, and how much did he charge for this service, John? He charged uh, a pound per milk cow. A pound per milk cow. I don't understand that. Well, if you had seven milk cows, Dan would charge you seven pounds. For the introduction? No, he'd, he'd see the business through to the end. If, if, if it didn't work, <laughs> if, the marriage, if the marriage didn't take place, yes. any money which might have been paid out earlier in earnest, as they say, yes. would be handed back. I see. You know. I see. But, uh, was he a man of discernment, John? I mean, he was a man, uh, yeah. on a serious note, he yeah. was a man who knew to the ninth uh, the characteristics and the fibers and the idiosyncrasies of the people in his bailiwick. Yes. And none of the, a lot of these people would never have married but for them. Yeah. And uh, I know at the moment, I know at least 20 uh, of the couples who were married and they lived very happily. Yeah. And they were mostly shy people. Uh, and at the time, you see, there was a big history of mental illness in Kerry and the mental home in Killarney was generally full and it was filled with people who had sexual problems. And if you mention sex at that time, the clergy went stone mad. <laughs> and you had visiting missionaries at the time as well who would rave and rant about the evils of close dancing. <laughs> and, but and, even, and company keeping. Company keeping and kissing, but even most in close dancing was cheek to cheek dancing, which was the most heinous and vile sin of all. We went to bed at nine and put out the lights. There's nothing like that. Listen dark. to me. Shut your mouth. For romance. Don't say a word. We lay side by side, not stirring nor moving, like two game cocks, each waiting for the other to make the first move. The next thing I heard was a yawn. After that, a snore. Then he was snoring away. I waited and waited till the clock struck ten. I decided to wake him up. I shook him and pinched him high and low. But you'd get better response from a pillow. That tricky dicky was how I spent my wedding night and every subsequent night since. You palmed up a non-starter on me for the second time running. I'm home to my mother's, and I want my money back from you now. But what's done cannot be undone. Give the man time. I've given him time. I gave that other carbog time. I've given you time. Now, I've had enough. I am leaving the blacksmith to his shoes and his anvil. You may be sure he knocked more sparks out of that than he ever knocked out of me. You, you have my sympathy. What attracts me to, to Dan Paddy Andy? Do you think that there is a need for his kind of person in Ireland today? The oh, yes. And are they still there? They're not, are they? No, they're not. They're Father Cain's uh, marriage bureau of knock is an excellent yes, uh, yes. thing. But you need... It's not the same kind no, of thing. you need a person in touch. There is one matchmaker uh, still working, Kerry Kerry and Mr. McMahon called Pastor Gerden. But Dan was unique. As I said, Dan knew the fibres and the weaknesses of his characters, and he knew their backgrounds. And Dan knew what loneliness was. It's a national problem. The West is becoming less and less populated as time goes on. Every parish you go to, there are 50 and 60 bachelors waiting for women. And these are reasonable men. They, they, they can afford to support the woman, to keep a woman. And there are a lot of women there anxious to get married, but they are not going to go up to a man and ask him to marry. You're on the market for a wife. Uh -huh. Well, if that be the case, I might be able to meet you once. I have a good farm, 50 acres and a car, and my intentions are honourable. No, uh -huh. first things first. Would you fancy a uh, fatter thing, rangier, butty, uh, older, uh -huh. young? But uh, if you said by me, uh, you'll stick to the older women. Drive on the port wine, and you'll end up with as game an article as ever drew breath. You see, the point about sex is dislike. Sex is not a serious thing. Sex is supposed to be funny and enjoyable, not something you rant and rave about and give out about. So there has to be something radically wrong with uh, the basic attitudes of these people to begin with. So sex is a celebration. As for the illicit sex, that's the matter for the person himself. But uh, in Kerry, any man who had uh, a reputation for excessive uh, sexual encounters with the opposite sex uh, attracted large crowds to his funeral always because they had a great regard for this type of person in Kerry. They knew that there were rumblings the, and rantings in the background, but that background was far away. 
and that this man was being buried with, with all the pomp and ceremony that he so richly deserved. Have we gone too far? You talk about the missioner and the clergy and their mm -hmm. attitude to sex and company keeping and all that sort of carry on. Would you say now, John, in your own mind, have we gone too far the other way? No. In these no, no I, I don't think so, no. no. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> Not yet. Why so do you say that? I don't think so. I think that, that uh, the young people of today are not as, as uh, immoral as, as, as is suggested. There is no great change, basically, in the attitude of Irish people towards sex, except that uh, they're starting to see you now that sex should never be taken seriously, because anything which would, of such a short duration should not be reckoned as a very important commodity. It's here and gone. And to, to make something out of it is just an obsession. And if anything upsets you, it's going to retard your natural life. Well, there's a memory of it all in your book, Man of the Triple Name. John B. has, over the years, done acres of TV work, but often it was just that, work. I found it a chore, obvious. <clears throat> I never wanted to do it, consciously. 